to verse 13, chapter 4 and verse 13. Let's read that together. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, everyone. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Okay? Uh, so, we sorrow not as the world. See, when a child of God passes away, right? When a child of God passes, that we're close to, right? We're close. How many have had somebody pass that you were close to? I think everybody in the room, right? Huh? You've had somebody pass and you cried. You say, well, don't cry because they're with the Lord. Yeah, they're with the Lord, but we're going to miss them. <laughs> so there's a sting. There's still a sting to death. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, say, well, it says there's no, there's, then shall be brought to pass the saying, there's no sting. So there's still a sting to death. We're going to miss them. But I want you, want you to know, folks, we sorrow not as others which have no. Now, the people that don't have any hope, they're, they're full of sorrow, man. That's, <laughs> they got nothing to look forward to. They're full of sorrow unless they re receive Christ and get saved. But we sorrow not as the world sorrows. So, honey, you're going to see your mom again. She's in the next room. She's just, you know, she's waiting for you. Your dad, my mom and dad are waiting for me. Both of them received Christ. Both of them, I had the privilege, later in their life, Kimberly, later in their life, to baptize with these hands. And when they came up out of that water... <laughs> I had the privilege to say, this is my beloved father in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> this is my beloved mother in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> now look, not all of our loved ones are going to be saved. Right? Now, I want to claim them all for Jesus. Amen? <laughs> We're going to do the best we can to win our loved ones to Christ and our friends and our neighbors. Brother Frank was convicting to me the other day. He said, and how about our neighbors? <clears throat> See, it isn't just going out and knocking on doors, right, that we go soul winning. When you go to the bus stop, hey, you know what? That's a great ministry, Phyllis. Bus stop ministry. <clears throat> Amen. Restaurants. Amen. Go into restaurants. Right? We sorrow not as others which have no hope. And so Jesus is coming again. God speaks in threes. We got John 14, John 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, each of these passages are in depth about how the fact that Christ is coming back for us and rapturing us, taking us to heaven with him, and then we will have the judgment seat of Christ, tribulation will take place, and then we're coming back with him. Amen? And the battle of Armageddon will take place, and then we will go into the millennial reign of Christ, at which the end, during, by the way, the millennial reign of Christ, Satan will be bound. Amen? I think his demons are going to be bound too with him. Amen? So we're not going to have any demonic influence like we have today. He's all over the place. Just go to Home Depot and see where people are crowding around the Halloween decorations, right? Wow. I mean, demonic stuff. It's like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's weird. It's creepy and weird and demonic. I mean, these, quote, politicians and the, the, the things that are spiritual. So they're spitting out of their mouths. It's just a bunch of demonic stuff. It's horrible. 
And so we're under attack, beloved. We are in hostile territory. Know that. In this world you shall have tribulation, but what? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so right now in the near, I mean, look at Israel, poor Israel. I've walked that land. I've been there. And those precious people. They're just precious people, the Jewish people. And they love that we come to their land. And I see these little girls in the military there. Young men, little girls, trying to protect their homeland. Someday they'll all be saved. Amen? Israel will be saved. They will turn to the Savior. They will know. They will look upon him whom they pierced. And they will come to Christ, and they will be our, our brethren and our sisters. They'll all be Messianic Jews. Amen. And so we speak, we're going to take one of these passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, in relation to the second coming. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, every chapter, beloved, speaks to us of this rapture, of this second coming. Okay? 2 Thessalonians speaks to us of, of course, we have two, uh, two parts of the second coming, right? We have the rapture, that's where he's coming for his saints, and then the revelation, that's where we come back with the saints. Amen? He's coming back with his saints. And here it is, verse 9. For they themselves show of what manner of entering in. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9. We had unto you, and how, here it is, their salvation. How ye turned to God from idols. Amen. There was a turning there, wasn't there? Amen. Bob was talking about repentance this morning, right? Well, there it is. That's repentance. They loved these idols. And then they turned from the idols. But they didn't just turn from the idols. They what? To God, right? <laughs> okay. Now, it says they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. And to, well, let's read verse 10, everyone, out loud. And to wait for his son from heaven, amen, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. That's what we're doing, folks. We're waiting for Jesus. Amen? We're waiting for him. All right? And it isn't just me, but preachers, great preachers down through the years have preached this. Many years ago, there was a doctor. A doctor got saved. His name was M.R. Hahn. You ever heard of him? He was a preacher. And he started a <clears throat> he started a ministry. Matter of fact, <clears throat> Pastor Bowler knew him. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. and Pastor Bowler knew M. R. D. Hahn, and M. R. D. Hahn was considering having Pastor Bowler take over that work. <clears throat> it didn't happen for some reason. I can't remember what happened, but uh, I think it was his son. His son came in and said, uh, I'm taking it over. Okay. Pete or whoever. I don't know. There was, a, there was a number of sons there. And they started Our Daily Bread. Now, the reason we don't carry Our Daily Bread right now is because Our Daily Bread is not what it used to be. <clears throat> like, like a lot of colleges and a lot of churches, they're not what they used to be. Okay. So we have uh, 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 Days of Praise over here. You want uh, pick that up one of those and if would you pick one of those up days of praise and we have call to glory which I write for it uh, every couple of years <laughs> I haven't written lately okay so I want to encourage you you know have that daily devotional but MR Dehan started our daily bread which was a fantastic and by the way I mean you can still read it you can still get something out of it okay I'm not bashing it it's just not what it used to be okay so let's listen to M.R. Hahn. He was uh, fantastic on the radio 
back in what? Bell, the 50s, 60s, 70s? Okay, I'm not sure yet. But back, way back when, okay, and 50s, 60s, 70s in there. All right, let's listen to him now. This is M.R.D. Hahn. So strikingly of the, of the fact that Jesus did come and did die and did rise to save you, this is the best time in the world I know of that you ought to receive him. One of these days he's going to come. The Christians will rejoice, but for you who are left behind, it will mean only eternal doom. Some golden daybreak Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak battles all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak he's coming for me. Will he be coming for you? <laughs> That's good, isn't it? <laughs> Music has always been a vital All part right. of evangelism. Turn it off. Some men have been able to That's combine it. it. All right. Will he be coming for you? And M. R. D. Hahn was, uh, he, he, he preached a lot on the second coming of Christ and the rapture. And so uh, we serve the living and true God now. All right, chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, if you would. And verse 18. Are you there? 1 Thessalonians 2.18 Wherefore we would have come, a, a, come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But what happened? Anybody? What happened, James? Have you got it? You don't have it? No, no you need to have your own Bible. All right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to catch you at a bad time. Okay. Let's read those last three words together. Oh, four, right? But Satan hindered us. You know, I'll never forget that Deborah down there at Access Tucson. I was going to say, Bob, where did Bob go? He disappeared. Okay, he had to, okay. Never mind, right? There he is. Remember Deborah? And you know what she would say? Now, this silly woman would say, oh, I don't believe in Satan. I thought, you know what I told her? I said, you start serving God, you start going soul winning. I said, you'll know there's a devil. <clears throat> He'll start opposing you. He'll start resisting you. He'll start hindering you. And that's a, everywhere Paul went, he had the hindrance of Satan. You see, the door of su spiritual success swings on the hinges of satanic opposition. Right? And so he says here, Satan hindered us. Verse 19, everybody, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, everyone? For ye are our glory and joy. I can look down through the hall of ministry. Ye are our glory and joy. I was thinking this week how much I love you all. What a joy you are to me. Ye are our crown of rejoicing. You know what? When we get to heaven, the Lord is going to dispense some crowns, some rewards to us. Did you know that? When we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Well, he's saying here, he said, he said to the Thessalonians, he said, what is our hope or Joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye. So there's a crown of rejoicing for those who win others to Christ. I want to ask you a question. Are you going to get the soul winner's crown? Is there somebody? Leonard, wake up. <clears throat> Come on, buddy. You got to leave if you... Yeah. All right. Okay, help him out. Help him out, James. Pick up the chair for him. Help him out. Leonard, just sit down, okay? Sit down, buddy. <laughs> All right. Have you led somebody to Christ? Is there somebody you've led to Christ? Is there somebody you can point to and say, I led that person to Christ. I led them through the plan of salvation. And I not only led them to Christ, but I discipled them. That's where the hard work comes. Thank God for those who get saved. But guess what? We need to disciple them too. Okay, we got Joanne 
and Jennifer. Now you notice they're not here this morning. And Delia. And and I, I gave them a lesson. I said, you need to work on this. Delia said she's going over there Monday. I think she went over there, but you know what? Satan hindered them. So discipleship is hard work. There's a crown of rejoicing. There's a crown of righteousness for those who look for his coming. Amen. Second Timothy 4 8. There's a crown of glory for those who faithfully teach and preach God's word, 1 Peter 5, 4. The incorruptible crown, beloved. Okay? The crown of life for those who suffer for the name of Christ. Have you suffered for Christ? And so, in relation to soul winning, Satan will always hinder us. Let's go look and let's go reach somebody else for Christ, shall we? And then in, in relationship, this is very important. Uh, chapter 3, okay? Chapter 3 in relation to stability and being established and rooted, okay? 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. All right, let's read verse... 13 out loud together very important word in there to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God right okay even our father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints of course that's the second part of the second coming but he's speaking here about that second coming all right see as we have as we understand that Christ is coming again, and we look at, at the, the, the crumbling world that we live in, you got to understand something. Jesus is going to come back and set it all in order. <clears throat> Amen? He's coming back. <laughs> so this world we live in right now, all of the wickedness and all of the violence that's going on, Look at just the political division. I mean, we got millions, tens of millions of Americans who want to plunge headlong into socialism. Communism, whatever you want to call it. It never works. It's never worked. Never worked in this world. People are not trying to break in to Venezuela. <laughs> People are not trying to break in to Cuba. <laughs> right. They're, they're, they're escaping these places, right? To come to a place of freedom and capitalism. All right? Capitalism is not evil. Okay? Gives everybody a fair shake. And it's amazing to me the wonderful, incredible testimonies I see of people. Years ago, Carol and I... We were here in uh, Tucson. This was probably 18 years ago, honey. We went to a little Chinese restaurant. They're on, was it 22nd Street? And we went in there, and the lady was a Christian, Chinese lady. And she got saved. <laughs> yes. And she gave us a testimony of how God saved her and her family. And they supported Desert Christian School. Incredible how they came from China and, 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 and opened a restaurant, just scraped and scratched together what, what little they could. Just amazing. Fantastic. But God wants us to be stable, folks. He doesn't want us to be uh, 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 like, like, like unstable. And, and this word stability is important. That's right. Isaiah 33 and verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. That word stability there in Isaiah 33 and verse 6 is the only time the word stability is used. But in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, and actually, in Isaiah 37, 31, it talks about taking root downward that we may bear fruit upward. Folks, we need to be rooted 
and grounded in Christ and his word. This is why we have these Christians who are apostatizing and falling away. They're not grounded. They're not grounded in the word of God. They're not rooted and grounded in him. Go read Ephesians 3.17, rooted and grounded. In 1 Peter 5.10, it says, But the God of all grace, get this now, but the God of all grace, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you for his glory. He wants to establish, strengthen, settle you. Think of those three S's for his glory. He wants you to be established and strengthened and settled in him and in his precious word. <clears throat> so he wants us to have that stability in our lives. Number four, quickly, and I'm going to give you a great truth. We're going to go maybe early today. Verse Number four, chapter four and verse 13. We already gave it. Verse 13, everyone. Uh, I'll read it first, and then we'll read verse 14. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So <clears throat> we don't sorrow as the world. We realize we're going to see them again. God's people said, amen. amen. We're going to see those, those, those saints again. Even the weakest saint, by the way, not just the spiritual ones, but the weak ones too. People who have sinned. I uh, I got one of the most tragic reports this week, this last week. It was a man who uh, got saved. He was in the Green Beret. I mentioned it last week, I think. He was in the Green Beret, and he got saved. And he went to Hiles Anderson College. He became Dr. Jack Hiles, one of his, on his protective detail. And he graduated and he uh, went out to uh, actually Lancaster and worked on the staff there. But he was kind of bossy and pushy. And Brother Chapel said, You're not fitting here. You know, uh, you need to move on. And so then he went to pastor a church in Tennessee. He had 11 children. And a report came up that he had uh, improperly, uh, there was a sexual uh, thing with children or something that came up. And uh, I see, how does that happen? I, he, you know, how does that happen? 11 children he has. You think he'd have enough, you know, enough, you know, act, uh, activity at home, right? He went into a restroom and shot himself, killed himself dead. The Family Baptist Church of Columbia, Georgia, are without their pastor this morning because he took his own life. And this is the kind of thing that we're seeing today. Another pastor down in Texas, Steve, uh, Steve Lawson. I don't know who he is, but I guess he's pretty popular with some of our independent Baptist men, resigned. I mean, this is happening. Uh, what's his name? The... Uh, the black pastor, um, he resigned as well. Famous black pastor. What was his name, honey? Mm. Look, folks, I'm just going to tell you, I'm trying to walk a really narrow line here. I, wanna, I want my life to be above reproach. I don't want you to look at... Okay, I'm really thankful that in the qualifications for pastor, it says <clears throat> blameless, not sinless. I'm not sinless, but I want to be blameless. I don't want you to point your finger at me and say, well, you're immoral or you're, you're, you're covetous or, or this or that. I, I just want to be above reproach, okay? Married to the same woman for 49 years, okay? <laughs> I thank God for, you know, I won the wife lottery, amen, but it wasn't a lottery. I was in the right place. I was where I was supposed to be. I was in Bible college, amen, and I came from California. Little did I know I was going to meet this precious little young lady 
from Michigan. And we met in the middle, sort of. She didn't have to go as far. Wisconsin. And I want to tell you something. It's, it's, it's been wonderful. It hasn't been easy. We got a little plaque up on the, on the mantle. What does it say, honey, on there? It says something like, life doesn't have to be perfect in order for it to be wonderful. <laughs> Amen? I mean, we, like, we could sing with, with the songwriter. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. We, we don't sorrow as others who have no hope. I want you to go to John chapter 11, if you would. Wherefore, I want, wait, I want you to see this. Uh, wait, verse 14. Let's read it together, everyone. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or literally proceed. That's what that word means them which are asleep. Everyone, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, that's half the rapture. Thank God there's another half. Amen? What does it say, verse 17, everyone? then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Everyone, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, for those who believe in a mid-trib rapture or uh, uh, the Andersonites, the, the sixth seal rapture, see, we can't comfort them because... They're looking for Antichrist. We're looking for Christ. That's what God, the Lord has never said in his word that we're to be looking for Antichrist. He says we're supposed to be looking for Christ. That's what Titus says, right? That's what Paul says. That's what John says. We're looking for Christ. He's not going to drag his bride through all that judgment. He's taking us out. We're going up for the marriage supper. Go to John chapter 11. I want to give you this before we go. I want to give you an insight here that the Lord gave me. It was just so precious. John 11. It should. Be, it's in your notes there. John 11. You see it there down there by... Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, John 11. See it there? And what do I put in there? A little quote. What? Four, no, four what? Long days. All right? Four what? Long days. John chapter 11. All right, try to stay, stay with me for at least a couple minutes here. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. I love Bethany. What a joy it was to be there, to be in that tomb of Lazarus. This was the place that Jesus went, folks, when he wanted to have some, let me put it, should I say some fellowship time, some downtime, just, just to, for, for, for refreshment and renewal, he would go to Mary and Martha's place in Bethany. God's people said, amen. There needs to be a place that you can go. And so he would go there. And he loved them. I mean, you know about it. You know, Martha was cumbered with all those things, and, but Mary worshipped him, right? And Mary had chosen the good thing, right? Yeah. Okay. And so this was that place. So Lazarus was sick, their brother, and it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with and with her, uh, uh, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So they came to Jesus, and the sisters sent unto him, saying, now this was before we had cell phones, right? You wonder why they didn't just get on the cell phone and text Jesus, right? <laughs> well, 
They didn't have those contraptions. So what they would do is they'd, they'd get a young man like the Pony Express, right? And that guy would run, and he ran to Jesus. Jesus, he whom thou lovest is sick. You need to come. And so Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, well, I got to get going right away, right? Is that what Jesus said? No. Nope. Verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days in the same place where he was. And after that, he said, well, let's go to Judea again. His disciples said to him, the Jews have laid of sought thee there. And uh, <clears throat> so, verse 11, these things said he, uh, after that he saith unto him, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Then his disciples, verse 12, said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Albeit Jesus spake this of his death. But they thought he had spoken of his taking rest and sleep. Jesus said, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Thomas, and here, here's Thomas, here, here he is, here's, uh, 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 you know, he always has, always has a cloud over his head, right, Thomas? And Thomas said, which is called Didymus, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Boy, that's a real encouragement. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, beloved, John 11 is a picture and a type of the rapture, okay? And so he laid there four days. He was dead four days. Then Martha, verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. She wouldn't even go. I don't even want to see Jesus at this point, right? That's kind of her attitude. I'm not going. <laughs> she sat still in the house. So Martha went unto Jesus. Those four long days, that's what I want to think about today. How hard it was for Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. While Lazarus, they, 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 they wound him up, they put the spices on him. And they laid him in that tomb. I've been in that tomb. You go way down these steps. There might have been another opening on the other side. I don't know. But we went down about 50 steps down into that tomb. I got a picture of myself in there. And now think about that. They're sitting there and they're saying, all those four days, <clears throat> Why? Why didn't he come? We sent and told you he was sick. I mean, when Jesus first came, he, I mean, I, I'm, look, I, I know what the Bible says, and I want to kind of think between the lines, if we could. She said to him, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. I'm sure also, why didn't you come sooner? Right? He's dead. He stinks. Where have you been? Let me ask you a question. How did it turn out? <laughs> We all know how it turned out. <laughs> Amen? And we're all tempted in our time of suffering, a time of sorrow, a time of need, to say, where are you, God? Why are you leaving me down here suffering like this? You know what? It always turns out <laughs> for the child of God. <laughs> I... Look, I yell at God. Not when anybody else is around. I yell at God. I cry out to him. 
Psalm 107. Go read it. I love Psalm 107. And then Mary. When Mary came, saw him. You know what? She did pretty good. She fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. He groaned in the spirit. This is the only time we see the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Right? And he got down to the grave. He said, take the stone away. Here's a picture of the rapture. He said, he's, he stinketh, man. He, he, he's been there four days. And then he said those same famous words, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. And I think that's exactly the way it will be in the rapture. For those dead bodies, he's going to call those dead bodies out. I don't care where they are. I don't care if you've cremated them. I don't care where their ashes are. I don't care if sharks eating them. God knows where those molecules are. He's going to call them all back. To that body. I don't know how he's going to do it. That's God's business. I'm just in the preaching business. Okay? I'm in the preaching business. Okay? And that's what the Bible tells me. And he says, loose him and let him go. Some of us are walking around in the old grave clothes of the old life, aren't we? Huh? And God wants us to let you loose and let you go. But we are, we're saying now, we're, now we're in the situation, let's stand together, we're in the situation where we're saying, Lord, where are you? You're late. Israel's became a nation in 48. You said this generation won't pass away. Right? Now those people born in 48 are in their 70s. The world's on fire. You gave us blood moons, signs in the stars, signs in the heavens. The whole world seems to be against Israel right now, except for good Bible-believing Christians. Lord, how long? Revelation 6.10, those martyrs say, how long, Lord? Right? And that's what we're saying. We're in, you and I are prophetically in those four days. Our, our loved ones have died, and the world is on fire. Earthquakes, famines, floods, pestilences, signs in the heavens, signs on earth. Everything's ready and right for the coming of Christ. So where are you? Let's say it together. Even so come, Lord Jesus, I'm ready. How about you? I'm ready. Now look, folks, I didn't always have this attitude. My attitude for the first 50, 40, 50 years of my Christian life is, Lord, hold off. Don't come yet. We want to win more souls. We want to serve you. We want to set the world on fire. Uh, I'm ready, Lord. I put some time in for you. I know I've failed. I know I've stumbled and fallen. But Lord Jesus, we've tried to be faithful. <laughs> We're ready for you, Lord. Please come. Even today. Come, Bob. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Like Mary and Martha. It would be so wonderful to see Mary and Martha and Lazarus in heaven. 